Welcome to another Unwinding with Fiber and Fabric. I decided to come outside this morning and do a little spinning. I had to take off my glasses because it was lightly raining and it is, to say the least, a little humid. But there is a slight breeze. It was beautiful out here when I first started spinning. I thought I had some good footage to share, but sadly, technical difficulties <laughs> have made it so that footage isn't available. <clears throat> but I still wanted to come to you from this beautiful uh, July, early July morning and show you what I'm spinning today. I decided to spin the Lester long wool that I had selected. This is from a lamb named Anna. And as you can see, it is a really long, beautiful lock. And what I've just been doing is I've been opening it up the lock just a little bit and spinning it from the cut end to the tip. It's been a wonderful spin. And while it is now a little bit noisier out here, there is some additional um, traffic noise behind me. It is still lovely. The wind is rustling the leaves just lightly and I still have some bird song even though it is getting a little bit later in the morning getting closer to lunchtime. I love coming out here early in the morning to spin because if I can get out and spin before 8 a.m. it's really quiet. Up here over the hill on the other side of the hill there's a fairly busy road that gets uh, a lot of early morning heavy truck movement and back there up that hill is a fairly busy commute road and I live in an area of the country where people somehow think loud exhaust um, muffler sounds are cool or manly or whatever and so I get a lot of that noise if I'm out here. Fortunately, I don't really hear it much when I'm inside. Sometimes in the winter, I'll hear a little bit more of the noise because the trees, the, the leaves on the trees buffer. And there is an airport over there somewhere nearby and I get some airplane noise. But for the most part, it's peaceful and quiet and it feels as if I'm just sitting in a little bit of nature. I'd be out in the grass spinning, but it rained last night and into the morning, so it's wet. And while last year I did do some spinning in the wet ground, I've decided to keep it a little drier. <laughs> it's easier to set up here on the porch. But I love spinning this Lester long wool. As I was spinning earlier this morning, I was thinking about its many the, the many uses you can use for something like this. It's a, a coarser fiber, but it spins so beautifully smooth and um, makes a good worsted um, yarn, especially with the singles. I could see this being quite a lovely warp in a woven project, especially a woven project for a rug, um, felted bags. A number of years ago I I spun some Herdwick, the outer coat of the Herdwick sheep. And I will show a picture here of the little knitted bag that I felted um, with that with that fiber. And it, it was a wonderful it was it was a wonderful sample spin. I still have more of the Herdwick to spin. But it was, a, it was a way to sample the fiber and also then knitting it up and sampling how it could be used. I think sometimes when we as spinners do sample spins, we don't take into consideration the importance of seeing how that fiber is best used. Knit it up, crochet it up, weave it, um, use it for needlepoint. So, I, I kind of like when I do um, some of my, my test spins, my sample spins, I'd like to actually see how it works in a project. And I have found, oh, 
nice breeze right now. I have found that Lester Longwool, its luster is wonderful. It's, it's got a lot of strength to it and care, um, durability. In the past, I have, we've, I've used it for um, punch needle. It makes a very dense, heavy um, piece. I have also crocheted with it, and it makes <laughs> quite, quite the unique amugurami or little stuffed animals. They're heavy, they're dense, they're durable. Um, really quite unique and it takes it takes color well I hope that I'm not in too much shadow when I was spinning earlier there was a little better natural light um, distribution but it is what it is so as I was spinning as I was spinning this fiber earlier today I was thinking about all of these different ways that you could that you could use Lester Longwell and I know that it is used in weaving I know that it is used in um, some old traditional needlepoint work. Um, it made me think of uh, a needlepoint cushion or cover on a chair that my great grandmother made nearly a hundred years ago. I'll show a picture here of the needlepoint. And the story that I like to, to tell because I got to hear the story from my grandmother herself when I was just in my early 20s and she was nearing. Um, the hundred year mark of her life. She talked about how as you know as the depression really settled upon them and as the, and they were farmers um, and 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 cattle um, they raised beef cattle and and grew co crops they um, you know the depression the depression hit everyone pretty hard. It made um, cash wealth, cash um, spending difficult, and a lot of their money that they ha you know would would go to just supplying the basic needs that they that they had. As most 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 farmers, most ranchers um, would have found at that time. But great grandmother, she. She decided to splurge and she took some of her money that she'd squirreled away in the jar and she went out and she bought some fabric for needlepoint, some needlepoint fabric. My great grandfather was handy with um, woodworking tools and he had made a rocker kind of glider chair for her and an ottoman to go with it and she wanted to cover this chair in needlepoint but in addition she she wanted to cover chairs for her children now about the time the depression hit um she already had quite a few of the seven children that she went on to have and in the end she she did she knew she had seven children as she was finishing these this needlepoint fabric but she only had six chairs for them and they're small chairs they are um, as as many a antique chairs of the age they're they're not as big and bulky as what we're accustomed to um, I doubt my great grandfather would have felt very comfortable <laughs> sitting on one, but the seven children would have had no problem sitting on these chairs. My great grandmother loved to tell stories, and so I'm sure there were many times that she sat her children around on the chairs and she told them stories as she worked on her different projects. She was a phenomenal quilter and tatter. I have some. Um, woven rugs, some rag rugs that she had done. She was just, she was really just a very talented um, woman of her day. And so she sat and when her husband was out with the cows, she'd work on this needlepoint and then she'd put it away. 
So it was not. So he didn't know. He didn't. She, he didn't know about it until it was all done. And then she looked at him and said, "All right, now go out and find me a seventh chair. I need a matching seventh chair." And it's not like you know today where you can just go online and find a chair, or go to Walmart and find a chair. He had to go out and look for a chair. <laughs> and amazingly, unfortunately, he found the seventh chair, a seventh matching chair in the barn of, I think, his parents' home. <laughs> and he brought the chair back to her and she covered the chairs. And when she was finally too old to live on her own and she moved in with her youngest child. She gave each of her surviving children and the descendants of the ones that had passed away each one of these chairs. And when my grandfather needed to go into assisted living at the end of his his life it was one of the few things he took with him not that he ever sat in it to my knowledge after the time he was a child <laughs> but but he took it with him as a reminder or memory of his his mother and when he passed away that chair came to me I had long suspected that most of my generation and my mother's generation were unaware of this story. Great grandma was well known for telling stories at Christmas of family members long past and, and tales of pioneers crossing the plains. But I don't suspect she told the story of that chair very often as the years progressed. Certainly enough members know about the chairs, about the story. I hope. But I just love the fact that I have I have the memory. Not just uh, the, the piece of furniture that sits in my my entryway of my the entryway of my home but the memory of sitting next to my grandmother and hearing her tell me these stories because she told me a few of them I wish there had been an opportunity to hear more I wish I could remember the ones that she told when I was little I do remember her telling the stories of different ancestors who crossed the plains when I became older and I got into genealogy, <laughs> I started reading the stories that had been written down and I had to chuckle because <laughs> as a little child at the knee of her great grandmother, I thought she was just talking about one person who had crossed the ocean and then crossed the plains and had had smallpox. I thought she was just talking about one person. She was talking about many, and in my mind, their stories had blended together, and it helped create the love of history, the love of family history that I have today. I do consider myself extremely fortunate to have examples of the handcrafts that my great-grandmother did. But I find myself even more, I consider myself even more blessed and more fortunate to actually have memory of her telling the stories, have memory of her making the, the items that she used to beautify her home. That's the real gem. And that's a gem that I try to pass on to my children. And if I'm fortunate enough, someday to pass on to grandchildren. When my daughter was young and I became the keeper of so many textiles that my grandmothers and my husband's grandmothers had made, I started to realize how fortunate my daughter was. 
because she knew her grandmother for a while. She learned skills from the women in our family. And as I started doing the genealogy and looking at the stories, I realized that she was seven generations documented of mother to daughter, mother to granddaughter, teaching of skills. Now, my grandmothers didn't teach me how to spin and they didn't teach me how to weave. My daughter actually taught me how to weave. But through them, through their sisters, both my daughter and I have learned how to quilt, to crochet, to knit. We've been inspired to try our hand at needle point. And weaving. And tatting. We've been inspired by them. And it is such a wonderful blessing. But one of the things that, as I think and ponder on how blessed I am to have this rich history. One of the things that I like to remind people and remind myself, history starts with us. When my grandmother was making her tatted curtains, yes, she tatted curtains. When my grandmother tatted curtains, she wasn't thinking about as much about the who had taught her as the who she was teaching. That was something that I learned from, from both of my grandmothers. I should say both of my great grandmothers. From my, my, my mom's mother and from my mom. It's not just about who we have learned it from, but who we are teaching. It is so important to take the time, if you have these skills, to share it, to pass it on, to share the love. And I think that's what's one of the wonderful things about things like Torta Fleece that we're doing right now. It's about sharing this love and passion. It's about sharing this joy, sharing the serenity and peace that we get from filling a bobbin, scouring the wool, knitting up a shawl or a blanket. It's the, it's not the final, it's not necessarily the finished object that inspires us to sit for hours. I think it's the peace and serenity that we get because we sit and do these things. I think that is the greatest product of our efforts. So I am spinning up this Lester Longwool and as I said, as I was thinking early about earlier today about these things, I started thinking about my great grandmother and her chair. And I thought, you know, this wool would be a wonderful wool to use for needlepoint. I think I may be need to go and buy some needlepoint fabric and see what I can do about making a little bit of needlepoint. I will say that I have technically done needlepoint in my youth. 
nothing that was worth keeping, nothing that was worth <laughs> showing off. So it's probably, I'm not in any way, shape or form skilled. I've seen some lovely, um, cruel, and I'm, I know I'm probably pronouncing it terribly wrong. So whoops, I'll put it, uh, I'll put it up here. Cruel work. I know it's a traditional, um, needle point, needle, needle work that you use a wool. I know that this wool would be lovely for it. Um, places like Colonial Williamsburg will use um, wool like this as well. It has a wonderful luster, so it, it could be very lovely. It take and as I said, it takes it takes the dye really well. So I could do that, but I think what I may do, I may see if I can have my husband make me a small doll sized chair or source me one. And maybe I will do a little needlepoint cushion for a doll chair or a footstool. Something simple, something that wouldn't take me years and years or something that I could start and hand off to my daughter if it was something I was terrible at. <laughs> my daughter, <laughs> my daughter has definitely inherited the talent and skills of her grandmothers before. <laughs> so, and the patience. <laughs> so, that's kind of what I just wanted to come and do a little bit of this spin. And now as I have been doing this even though I know I'm a little bit in shadow and there's more truck noise. I think I'm kind of glad that my earlier footage had technical issues because this extra little spin, another 10 grams of fiber, it's helped me remember why I'm doing this. Oh, there's the airplane. It's helped me remember why I am doing these videos. It's helped me remember why I'm doing Tour de Fleece. It's not just about the finished product. It is about the journey and sharing that journey with old and young, beginners, people more advanced, men and women, with people of all characteristics and types. So, I hope this time has been enjoyable for you. Hope you've enjoyed my story. <laughs> and I think I will wrap up by hoping you have a wonderful day of unwinding with fiber and fabric and that you can find joy in the process and in the journey. We will see you again soon. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.